going on? Welcome back into another episode of Short Shifts, the North American Hockey League podcast. Brandon Hofstra joined here with Vinny Paraselli. Season two, episode two, episode number 15 total. We're getting up there, Vin. We're almost uh, almost at 20. I think that might be a milestone. We're going to do something big for that. Yeah. I mean, you might you might know a guy for that. I'm just saying. I'll keep texting him and see if it, if it pays off. But so far, it's uh, – just ghosts going, but uh, good, good, uh, good podcast in store today. I should say, a good guest. We got um, the boring bowl, the face off between Vinny and Ryan Anderson. The, will we find out if he's boring or not? I guess you'll have to stay tuned until the interview there. But um, league full force, we're going. It's what are we now? Week four, week five. We're in. We're in October, right? You know, it's, it's officially hockey season's underway. Guys are making commitments. You know, we're starting to see a little bit of, you know, who's starting off hot, who's starting off pretty cold. I mean, some teams are already 10 games in. That's one six of the season. I mean, we're we're rolling. Right. Definitely rolling. Definitely um a lot to get to. We're gonna pretty much jump right into the uh the divisions um and how they sit right now. Anything you want to add before we kind of hop into that, Vinny? Um, just one thing I gotta say is that um some of the competition has been fierce. We had a couple weekends ago, we had like eight games go to overtime or shootout. Um, we had a couple of not boring games this past weekend. It's been, it's the, the action has been exciting so far. Right. Well, let's jump right into the central division. It's held now a uh, first place spot. I guess it could be a tie. You got the Austin Bruins, Bismarck Bobcats. I believe a few weeks back when we did our first podcast, Bismarck was down around the fourth, fifth, sixth place spot in the central. But uh, right now, like I said, Austin leads five and one, 10 points. Behind them is Bismarck, five and three with 10 points. Um, pardon me. Then we go to third place spot with the St. Cloud Norseman, eight points. Aberdeen with seven, a three and four record, three, four, oh, and one. Minot, three and one with, a, with six points at the fifth place spot. And uh, North Iowa down there, um, one and six with just two points. So, um, Bruins, Bobcats, obviously uh, two coaches that have been around this league for a long time, two guys that know what they're doing up there. Uh, just kind of talk about the Central Division, Vinny. Um, I mean, we talked about Bismarck getting hot. Well, they got their medicine in facing North Iowa. They own North mm-hmm. Iowa. If you go back to last season, they've won eight straight against them, six to end the season last year, two more this time around, a one nothing and a 5 nothing win uh, this past weekend. So, I mean – you know, you talk about getting right, get right series. That's a get right series for Bismarck. They've won four in a row, uh, tied for that first place spot. Austin, Austin's got a few games in hand, but you know, never too early to look at the standings. And then the, you know, the result, the or so I should say, the opposite of that. North Iowa uh, won the first game of the showcase. Haven't won since. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're getting, you know, it's been the showcase was a little bit ago. So you know, right. it's time to start. Uh, you know, maybe putting some pressure on. You don't. I mean, you can't win. You can't make the playoffs in September, October, but you can certainly knock yourself out of the playoffs in September and October. And then Minot just said the four games of the showcase. I mean, they they're just chilling. There's you know two weekends <laughs> off, getting getting right, getting those uh, maybe some guys from the USHL back. So mm-hmm. I'm in I'm in, intrigued to see how they come out. Maybe a little rust this up, upcoming weekend. Right, that's still just wild to me that they haven't played in in two weeks like that. Um, I don't know why, but I guess that's just. It's just weird to me. I guess I'm used to ice, junior ice hockey playing every single weekend. Told. Right, hit the road. Yeah, go play I, somebody else. Well, I, I don't think someone else got some ice either. So <laughs> who knows, man? We'll figure it out. They're they're in a figure it out. This is their little. This is their bye week. Now, like they're gonna play like the next like twenty weeks straight. So you know, that's fair. They'll catch that's up. That's fair. They'll catch. Yeah, exactly. Let's go to the East now. It was led by Northeast, who was undefeated. They're in second place, though, still doing great. Uh, Maryland leads that division, uh, 7-2 record, 7-2-0-1, pardon me, 15 points. Northeast, second place, 7-3 record, 14 points. Johnstown taking that third place spot. They were not looking hot at the beginning of the season, which to say beginning of the season, like we just said, was a few weeks ago, so things obviously change. Uh, so good for them, 6-4 and four right now, 12 points, third place. Maine, 5-2-0-1, oh 11 points. Rochester with 11 points as well. Five, four, zero, oh, and one. New Jersey Titans, five and five, ten points. New Hampshire, four and four, eight points. Philadelphia, eight, eighth place, three, five, record. Pardon me, six points. And Danbury, down there with two, seven, one, and zero oh, record and five points. Um, 
you know, Maryland, a lot of returners, I would say, from last year, they just had a big name of their of their franchise, if you want to call it that, um, getting a, a college commitment yesterday. We'll talk more about that tomorrow in the uh, in the show. But one, two in a row, seven, two, oh, one in their past 10. Northeast nipping up the heels, two, seven, three in their last 10. Johnstown picking it up, going six and four in their last 10. So uh, pretty tight over in the East. Yeah, very tight. Um, you know, second through or even first through, you know, sixth place, five points apart. Like that's that's nothing in, in today's game. Uh, Northeast was buzzing, like you mentioned, four and zero at the showcase a couple weeks back. Uh, split with Maine this weekend. Uh, if you if you just happen to follow the team on Twitter or X, um, they were not buzzing on Saturday night as they gave up six goals to Maine. Uh, I think it was an eight two final and. Uh, you can go check out the Northeast uh, Twitter slash X account for that mm-hmm. hilarious tweet that I saw that I just thought was just <laughs> perfectly well timed. I think we know who the admin is, and uh, he's got a few good zingers every once in a while. So uh, only once to see in that while. they get only once in a while. It's good to see they can you know be funny and do all that when they're losing. All you know because if you do it when you're winning, you can do it when you're losing. You know it, it makes yeah. it for a lot more fun. Maryland, like you said, a lot of returners. Uh, Dimitri Kibru's still there. Uh, Kareem El Bashir had a good week. Uh, you know, just talented up and down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, we <laughs> we joked with uh, Craig Duramus and even Brian Erickson during the, the NA Now videos that we did at the start of the year. You know, it seems every year the new team in the East that you know makes it to the Robertson Cup. Tell you what, I know we're only ten games in, a lot of season left to go, but Maryland sure looks like that team that could break that streak and uh, make it to back to back Robbies. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, let's go over to the Midwest now. Janesville leads with 12 points, 5-2-2 two, and two record. Kenai River right behind them, 5-4 and four with 10. Wisconsin, 5-3, 10 points as well. Fairbanks, 4-5, 0-1, 9 points. It's nice to see them with a pretty much a complete turnaround from, from uh, the showcase. Chippewa, 4-3, 8 points at 5th place. Anchorage, 3-2-2 two, and two with 8 points. 7th place right now, Minnesota, 3-3, three, 2-0. Three, Eight points in Springfield. Still looking for that first win. 6 two and zero with two points. Um, you know, I, I'm pushing for those guys. I think uh, Todd Pocock's a great guy. I think that that they, uh, you know, where they're at, they should they should have a team that should be getting some wins. You got kids from St. Louis. You're, you got kids from Chicago that should be coming to play out there. Um, so I'm rooting for them to turn things around. But obviously. If this is any any indication of last year at the Midwest, it's any given Friday, any given Saturday, like we talked about last year, every single episode where there's a new leader after every single weekend. So it's a lot to it's a lot to say right now that you like you said earlier, you can't count anybody out. Obviously, we're a month into this thing, but who knows? Well, now we're about to have some fun because Alaska home games are starting up. So that eleven thirty Eastern, ten thirty central start time is gonna start kicking in. Mm-hmm. And we're going to see, you know, what some of these teams are made of. I know Minnesota goes up this week uh, to face Fairbanks. You know, the so Colton St. Clair, he li- we talked to him early in the year. He liked that they had the early road trip up there, a big uh, team bonding experience to start yep. the year, get the boys acclimated with one another. Uh, you touched on Springfield. And, I mean, 33 goals allowed is just over four a game, which obviously isn't good. But I think the key for them is, the struggles on offense. They got 15 goals in, in eight games. It's not even right. two goals per game. You're not going to win if you don't score. I know our guest today uh, preaches some boring hockey, and it's all about the defensive game and you know preventing pucks from uh, going in your net. But you got to put the puck in that if you want to win. You can't score or you can't win by scoring zero or one goals too often. So uh, they need to figure that out. But like you said, the Midwest tight, very tight. You know, only four points separate first and seventh. So, mm-hmm. like you said, it's going to be an absolute dogfight throughout the year. And it's crazy because, you know, we we look at the games in January, February, March, and, you know, obviously April when, you know, that last week or two about being big games. I mean, every point is crucial, though. I mean, it's right. only October, but, you know, you can, you can, if you could get a weekend sweep or, you know, if you ain't going to win, if you could just get that game to overtime, that, mm-hmm. that point might be the one that gets you into the playoffs. We saw that last year with how it went down to the wire. I really like Janesville so far, man. Though Janesville, they got that they got that veteran experience now because they were so young last year. They got so many guys back. Like they're healthy again too. I really like them so far. Kenai River always seems to start good. Then they go back to Alaska and just they get into a funk. I mean, they got 
I'm just going to call it what it is. They got railroaded by Wisconsin this past weekend, two, two right. big losses. Um, but, you know, that just maybe goes to the window go just saying, hey, you know, we, we can put the puck in the net. We're a solid team. Fairbanks, as you mentioned, had a little bounce back. They've won four of their last five. So Chippewa on Anchorage, not too much to be seen from those guys yet. Obviously, a lot, a lot of hockey to be played. Anchorage going to have their first home game this weekend. The last couple openers are always fun. I'm actually mm-hmm. really interested, interested to see. I mean, we know the Fairbanks Ice Dogs fans bring it. We know Anchorage packs the barn. But Kenai, the last couple of years, we saw that playoff game last year ago, was like, you know, close to 3,000 people. I'm really interested to see how they have the home opener this week and how, how many seats they'd be selling out. Right. And I was telling you this, and I guess I'll share this with the fans as well or everybody partaking in this. Um, I met a guy in Texas at my part-time job that lived in Fairbanks for a little bit, and he said that it is an absolute – madhouse up there he said especially when when they play against the the uh wolverines or the brown bears no matter what he said the the big dipper gets absolutely going up there and he said it was really cool and he said it was cool too to see a few other teams come up i think he said he said i saw the wilderness come up there and chippewa come up there a few times but hey it's known down here in the lower 48 as a as a as a party place for junior hockey so that's pretty cool and that's cool that'll that mm-hmm. kick off here this weekend we got we gotta get uh we gotta get some we gotta get like a airline deal or something. We gotta get up there. I mean yeah, it, it's the no big sense. dipper. It's 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 probably one of the most I don't wanna say iconic because that might have unique too strong word, but unique and just like you said, like just a fun place to go to. Everyone talks yeah. about how great it is in Fairbanks to be a, you know an ice dogs player or working with the team or just even around the team watching as a fan. So I mean I, I we need to get up there at some point. Yeah. We need to we need to like pull some strings. Maybe you and I, maybe like you take some of that part time job money and we just, you know, go up on our own. Like, why not join the tailgate? Just saying. That's going to be tough with my $60 paychecks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you do it all year. We get, that's enough. Yeah, right. I'll save my pennies. Yeah. Yeah. I got to quit buying. Boots. We'll get up there in April. It's not a free <laughs> ad, by the way. I'm not going to say where I work at part time. No free ads. Anyway, anywho, speaking of uh, boots, what I do on the, on the side, we're going to look at the South Division now. Colorado Grit. Uh, they lead the the uh, South Division by five zero and one record, eleven points. I guess it's honestly a four way tie for first place. It's a four way tie. The it's a four way tie. Yeah. So you got Lone Star second, eleven points. You have Shreveport third place, quote unquote, with eleven points. Fourth place, quote unquote, New Mexico Ice Coast with eleven points. And you go to fifth place, El Paso with a five and two record, ten points. Oklahoma five and three with ten points. Amarillo four and two. With eight points, Corpus Christi three and four, zero oh and one, seven points, and Odessa three four, zero oh and one as well with seven. So, again, another crapshoot we'll call it. Um, just deadlocked, and it's I feel like it's going to be this way for quite some time until we get down to the old nitty gritty. That was not a Colorado grit hint, but you know what I mean. Well, and you look at uh, the standings page. You know we're back to the divisional play. Look at the streaks on that on divisional right. page. They're all ones except for Lone one, Star and two, Shreveport, two, who uh, Lone one. Star swept them last week. Yeah, so I mean, it's the play is just gonna it's gonna be like this. I think all year long. I I do, you know, we we sit there, we go, all right, we know Lone Star is gonna be pretty good. We know Shreveport's mm-hmm. gonna be in the mix. We kind of know New Mexico is gonna be in the mix. Amarillo, or sorry, Oklahoma won it all last year, so they're gonna be in the mix. Amarillo was a playoff team last year. That's just five teams right there that. We go, oh man, they could totally be in the playoffs and make a run. Then it's like, mm-hmm. oh Colorado, oh the eleven, you know, eleven games, eleven points. That's pretty good. Like, I'm not gonna try to be. I mean, I'm gonna just be honest. Like, I don't think any of us saw that coming out the gate. Yeah. Nope. Brand new team, brand new organization. You know, traveling a lot, going from Colorado to Minnesota. You know, and you know, playing three games before the showcase. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of us saw them being, you know, you know. You know, we got Corpus Christi Odessa, three, four, oh, and one. I think maybe that's where we saw them. Right. You know, right. I, and that's not that's not a shot of those other two teams, but no. The brand new teams is new. It's it's so hard to start up a new team. And you look at the other two new teams, Rochester, five, four, oh, and one, New Hampshire, four and four. Like, mm-hmm. you know, they found, <laughs> like that's credit to those coaching staffs that went out there and found these kids and recruited them. And especially like those tenders when you know tender season opens up here in the next couple of weeks for you know the youth guys. Yep. That's a credit to those guys. It's I'm pleasantly surprised at how good Colorado is to start the year. Not saying I thought they'd do bad, but it's just very tough as a first year organization to get off to a good start. Yeah. And speaking so, of that, uh, older teams, but sorry, 
Uh, no. Odessa Corpus, right in the mix though. Three, four, on one, seven points, just a couple points. I mean, two win. They're one weekend sweep from being in first place. So exactly, lots to be decided yeah. in that South Division. Speaking of new teams, uh, you, I guess this is a cool thing to look at as well. We looked at it two weeks ago when we did our last podcast with the top ten scores in the in the in the league. Um, nine of those ten are the East Division. Three of those ten are with Rochester. So that's something to say too for a new team. These guys aren't partnering around. They're putting the puck in the back of the net. You got Matteo Decipio, seventeen points. You got another guy, sixteen. You got one more, a defenseman who's number nine scorer in the league right now with thirteen points. So if they keep doing that, they're going to continue to rack up the wins. Well, and if you look at you know it's early, and I think the East has played a few more games than most of them, especially the Central. But you look at some of the scores we're getting out, out East. You know, five four. You know, four three, six four. Five, you know, it, high scoring affairs. I mean, <laughs> let's just call it what it is. It ain't the South, and defense might be optional. I'm just saying, like nothing against the goalies out there, because I'm sure there's some goalies with some good numbers. But I mean, Maryland forty goals in ten games. That's four a game. New, uh, Northeast thirty seven and ten. That's three point seven. I mean, Johnstown scoring three goals games. Rochester thirty nine and ten games. Maine forty goals in eight games. I mean. These teams are putting the puck in the back of the net with right. a high frequency. Yep, I agree. All right, there's a look at the divisions, how things sit right now, but any marquee matchups this weekend, Vinny, that our fans should keep an eye out on? Well, we got one that we're going to talk about a little bit later. It involves uh, a former coach going back to his old home. Mm-hmm. We're just gonna, you know, no spoilers there. Uh, I think Janesville, Wisconsin, that's the name of the town, but that's also the name of the two teams playing. Uh, yeah. James, will, one of the top teams in the division, Wisconsin coming off that big, big weekend against Kenai River. That's going to be a fun match to see. And then Kenai River at Anchorage, Anchorage at Kenai River the following night, a little home-and-home home action up in Alaska. I've been told that the tailgate is on, and I need to go up there and have the oh, – there's a – man, I'm going to be really mad. Is it? It's not bison. Some other kind of meat that was kind of different. I need to go up there for a burger that they make pregame every time. And I'm just blanking on the type of meat. I think it's where is this oh, at? Man. It's then Kenai River. I've been invited. Been invited. I don't, I don't they think wouldn't eat their own. They wouldn't eat their <laughs> yeah, own. Yeah, exactly. Come on. Yeah. Oh man, I'm blanking on it. Uh Ryan's gonna be mad at me from Kenai, but I can't remember what it's called. But it it sounds really good. Tailgate's gonna be on epic on Saturday night for the home opener. I'm expecting a big crowd, so that's a hostile environment for any team to go in, let alone another team from Alaska. All right. Um, I'm looking up eight best burgers in Alaska. Turkey burger, mushroom burger, veggie burger, wild salmon burger, a bean burger, or a cheeseburger. Have you ever had one of those? I, I mean, I've had a cheeseburger and a... That was a joke. Where, oh. <laughs> that, was, that was a joke. I don't know what it would be. <laughs> It oh um, man, it was something. It maybe it was was it, it wouldn't be duck. That's like that's not really a burger. Comment below know. what kind of burger you think it might be, and we'll find out. We'll comment if you're yeah, right. We'll, figure we'll, send, it out. we'll send you a t-shirt. Send you a shirt. Uh, All right. I like it. Well, with no further ado, let's send it over to our special guest, first guest of season two, Mr. Ryan Anderson, head coach of the Amarillo Wranglers. Well. It's the moment we've all been waiting for, for about going on over a year. Vinny has been calling this man that we are going to interview uh, his team boring, him boring. Use the word boring quite a bit. So we're going to introduce our guest, not boring, Ryan Anderson, head coach of the Amarillo Wranglers. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm glad that we're divided here online. So it's not you and Vinny physically going at each other. Thanks for having us uh, guys. I really, uh, really appreciate you getting me on. I think, uh, the Short Shifts podcast has been a great addition to our league, and you guys are doing a great job with it. So I'm I'm honored to be one of your guests. And one of our biggest supporters as well. We're going to get you a shirt and a hat or something sent out your way. But Perfect. Um, Vinny, sorry, I just cut you off. You are going to say something there. No, I was going to say this. I promise this won't be boring. We're going to uh, – Sparks <laughs> will maybe fly. I don't know. Me and RA typically get along in person. We just like online. I just bash them all the time. So that way you right. can't say anything in my face. <laughs> It's just like pro wrestling. There's got to be a heel, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Let's let's dive into this. All right, uh, Ryan. Well, I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. I'll I'll ask boring question. I mean, no, no. I'm just kidding. 
Um, we've asked you to like, you know, a couple of times we had a couple of zooms before, but uh, a couple of weeks into being a head coach in a, in the NHL, is it just like everything you ever imagined or is it different? Is it the same? Like, what did you expect versus the reality of it a couple weeks in? You know, I think being a, being a head coach in the NA3 really helped prepare me for some of the, um, for some of the challenges and issues that arise as a head coach. And I was ready for those. Um, I probably wasn't as ready for how much my phone is going to ring from advisors and players being available. Because when you're in, in the NA3, the, the pool of players that you're, that you're recruiting and are available to you is much smaller than when you're in the North American league. So just managing that time and managing the roster has been probably the, the biggest difficulty, but obviously I've had great help here with Harry Mahood still on board as the president and, and GM. So we've been, we've been attacking it as a team and it's gone very smoothly, but you know, it's been a, a busy and hectic, you know, couple of months from moving here to Amarillo from Dallas and then getting right into training camp and right to the showcase and, uh, but it's been really fun. The guys have been great. The city's been great. And I'm really excited to be here in Amarillo and the head coach of the, of the Wranglers. Yeah. Ryan, uh, you helped us turn the term boring into a fun joke. Uh, we like to talk about it here on air, obviously, and a good deal of time you spent in Lone Star, whether the NA level with Dan Wildbong being his assistant or head coach, like you said, in the 3HL. But uh, talk about what that program, just talk about that program and kind of that philosophy and and how you've kind of translated that now into this position that you hold now. Well, there, there's, I don't know if there's a better coach in the North American League when it comes to preparing a team to play the opposition they're playing that weekend. Like, Dan has such great experience between his time, you know, as a junior hockey player, college hockey player, pro, and then as a coach and pro and a coach in the North American League that there's not much he hasn't seen and there's not much that he hasn't th- seen that he doesn't have a plan for. So just being around that knowledge on a daily basis um, and really being able to soak that in was really, really helpful for the development of me as a coach. And I really owe him a lot for being in this position. I consider him one of my best friends in the world. Um, and then just how much he gets out of players and, and what the expectation level is for your work ethic away from the puck. I think a lot of times in the game, like we only worry about what's going on at the puck. But in Lone Star, you spend just as much time with the guys and working on the guys that are away from the puck that you do with the guys on the pucks to really make sure that – you're a connected 200 foot hockey team. And if you look at the, the history of the program, I don't think anybody's ever been a better defensive team since they've come in the league than Lone Star. And you look at the amount of goalies that have been able to be placed in division one because of the way the team plays in front of them is second to none. Uh, but they just do such a great job of getting their guys to work extremely hard on a consistent basis. And they work really hard on the things that are really hard and make a difference that don't necessarily show up on the scoreboard. How do you get, and I, like you said, you, you were there for a, quite a while. How do you get guys to buy into that though? Because I mean, you're getting, you know, some of the best guys that come out of these youth programs are sometimes, you know, the leading scorers in their team. And all of a sudden they're playing a third line, fourth line role as they come into the NA and they got to really embrace playing defense, playing a, you know, boring game. But if they don't do it, they'll be there. How do you get guys to buy in? Well, I think you look at the track record of the players that have moved on from that program. And the success that they've had in college, right? Um, let's be honest. Most of our guys in the North American League are not jumping right into a Division One program and playing on the first line and playing on the first power play and playing on the first penalty kill. They're going to be expected to play on a third and fourth line and be able to check and be able to be in the right spots defensively and play a 200-foot game that's honest and accountable. Um, and then they get to earn their opportunities to move up the lineup because the coaches can trust to put them out there as young players because they know how to play away from it. And I think that's the biggest thing is that when we're able to have a guy like Nick Niemo call back into our program and talk to our players about how the details matter and the things that they're going through and struggling are really making a difference for him translating to college hockey. It makes our younger players go, okay, I just have to be patient. I have to buy in. I have to believe that this is going to help me get to where I want to go. Ryan, every coach at some point has had that kind of epiphany moment. Uh, talk about your time as being a coach when you kind of realize where you're, you're saying to yourself, you know what, I can do this at a high level. And here you are now uh, at one of the highest levels in junior hockey. Yeah. So, I mean, I worked a regular job when I got out of the Navy. I was a government contractor and then I worked on the civilian side while I was still coaching. And what was what was making me want to get out of bed in the morning was not the job that was paying the bills, but the job that was 
you know, what I was passionate about, what I was, you know, I spent my youth doing that. I always wanted to become a hockey player. Unfortunately, uh, the talent equation and the size equation didn't work out in my favor, but I always had a passion for the game and loved the game. And then I was very lucky to be around guys that could, you know, mentor me and help me grow and, and learn as a coach and be able to be in some positions where they could make a phone call for me to help me out along my path. But um, when I, when I had the opportunity to go to Corpus Christi as the assistant coach with Brad Flynn, I was, you know, working a job that paid me significantly more, more money than, than I was making going to Corpus Christi. And a lot of people were like, what are you doing? And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's what made me excited. It's what made me happy. And, and going and working in a cubicle was not how I wanted to fulfill the rest of my life. So I, I took a leap of faith and, or there's some tough years and things like that along the path. Absolutely. But I don't get to be the head coach of the Wranglers if I don't take that leap of faith on myself and and understand that I know how hard I'm going to work at this because I love it. And I know the quality of people I've been around that have helped and mentored me. And and when I have questions, I have people I can go to and at, to get good answers. And I've learned and I've, I've become better. And I've, I'm definitely not the same coach that I was in Corpus Christi that I am now. And I'm definitely not the same coach that I am now that I was even in Lone Star. So it's been a really exciting path and I've, I've made mistakes. I've made good decisions, but you learn from the mistakes and you keep, keep moving forward and, and ask questions when, when you talk to people that have the answers. Uh, we had a fun realization at the showcase that you were from the charcoal capital of the world. Um, <laughs> yeah, growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what got you into the game of hockey as a, as a youngster, obviously you said the talent wasn't there, you know, as a player, but what got you start out how got you into the hockey to start with and then what got you into coaching i guess afterwards yeah so my dad was a big hockey fan like he never played hockey growing up but um he'd play on the ponds and things like that so uh, on my street block i grew up on and we had about three or four older guys than me that I all played so you know i saw those guys you know on the ponds and i wanted to do it and uh, my dad made the decision without my mom knowing that I was going to play hockey and, and I, they got me into hockey. And before you know what, I was, you know, playing until I was 18 years old and in, for my high school. And I was a decent little player, but I was a little player. Um, but that's where the passion came from. It was, it was being with my buddies, all my friends in the, in the world growing up, they all played hockey. We all played golf together. Like we were, you know, we were the wolf pack kind of, and we, we, we all just wanted to make each other better and pushed each other. And there was a lot of great people in my hometown that um, really fostered that love for the game. Like uh, my neighbor's parents, you know, Jim Dempsey, like he ended up being a guy that bought a skate sharpener and had it in his basement and sharpened our skates. And, you know, Mike Berglund, who would let me go up to the rink and turn the lights on for me and all those guys. And, and the Friday night men's league that I'd go play goalie in during men's league when I was 17 years old, just to be in the rink more. Uh, but I really just fell in love with the game. I fell in love with the culture and um, it's been the one constant in my life from the time I was five years old till you know, now sitting 37, it's always been a love for the game of hockey. For the listeners that didn't know it's Kingsford, Michigan, home of Kingsford charcoal. So I'm formally, guessing. Formally, formally the home. Okay. So I'm guessing you're lethal around a campfire to get a grill going or a grill or whatever that. And also, what are your thoughts on on the Traegers now? It's kind of taking over I the market. The to, be, to be honest with you, like if I'm going <laughs> to use the grill, it's going to be an old school like 22 inch Weber. I don't like gas. I don't like any yep. of that stuff. But the Traegers are awesome. Like um, the past couple of Thanksgivings, I've I've made uh, a smoked turkey on a Traeger and it comes out unbelievable. But you have to brine the turkey first. If you don't brine the turkey, it gets dry and it's not very good. Sounds like we should have a cooking uh, episode as well. Well, if you ask my assistant, I just brought in re mushroom risotto that I made the other night, and he uh, he he quite enjoyed it. Ooh, Chef Ra, was that what's what's your signature dish? I'm really good with the steaks, and they and they might call me the sauce boss with my uh, bolognese. <laughs> oh my gosh! All right, well, you're, you you're officially not boring bit. anymore. Jeez, <laughs> go ahead, Brandon. Merlo now a few months um, outside of hockey. What have you been doing? Obviously, I guess cooking. But what other stuff have you, have you guys been up to? Getting getting to know to the town outside of just a weekend. Not much. Not much. Like. I got here about a week and a half before we started training camp. So it was getting moved in and getting ready for camp. And then it's right into training camp, right into preseason, right into the showcase. Um, I do live downtown really close to the Civic Center. So I have gotten to 
to go out to a couple of the restaurants that are right downtown and they were really good and there's a great atmosphere downtown. Mm -hmm. So I've really loved it here. It's, um, it's not a big city by any means. It's not a Dallas or a Fort Worth. Uh, it's not a small town either, but it's one of those medium sized cities that has that small town atmosphere where people mm -hmm. say hello to strangers and open doors for you. And if, you know, you let them in in traffic, they give you the nice wave of saying thanks. So um, it's been a really great experience moving here to Amarillo. Uh, Austin Sutter has done such a great job in, in, in making the Wranglers brand important in Amarillo. If you drive around town and you, you look at various restaurants, there's the neon signs with our logo hanging in the window and, and people know who we are, which is great. And we had a great crowd for our home opener and there's just a lot of excitement about the Amarillo Wranglers right now in, in the town. And it's great to have that support. The first thing I thought of when you uh, said about the waves from strangers, are they the one finger or the five finger variety? Five finger waves. Oh, okay. Just making sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm Midwest nice still down here and people don't like when I wave at them in Dallas on the road. No, they, like, they look at you like you're a jerk. They're like, hey, what, what are you, are doing? you doing, dude? I'm just like, or I give them the old, it's a hello in the Midwest, just the finger on the steering wheel. And they're like, does he flip yeah. me off of them? Yeah. <laughs> Anywho, I'm going to throw this one at you, too. You spoke of uh, Austin Sutter, team president, team owner. Um, you talked about how your guys' logo is plastered all over town. Can you confirm with me that the Wranglers logo is basically just Austin's head with Wranglers across it? <laughs> I, I mean, I can see the similarity, but I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think... Um, I believe the guy that did our logo was the same guy that did the New Mexico logo. And I think he did a really great job with there's there's really small details in our logo. We just got the the mural printed or the mural painted in, in the hallway uh, as we go on the ice. Uh, and it looks great. The colors pop. Um, you know, it's a it's a sharp logo, but it could. I mean, the beard is similar, <laughs> right? I mean, I've seen like Austin's got a, a little headshot in his email signature and I'm like, got the beard. Got the stash going. Not maybe not as, as much as the logo, but I mean, it is just uncanny how much it looks just like them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you uh, started in youth hockey. You had a stint in the ECHL as a video coach. Yeah. What got you into juniors? Like, why juniors is that kind of area where you're like, I got to be here? Yeah. So, obviously, without having a professional or collegiate playing, uh, resume, you're going to have to take a little bit longer path and than, than you might necessarily want to, but it, it's also necessarily, you got to go to the woodshed and learn. So when I was in the East coast league, I was working for a guy named Eric Bayou, who's now coaching uh, the Quebec ramparts in the Quebec major junior hockey league. And I didn't want to just be a video coach. Like I felt as a video coach that I had a little bit of say in, in, in how the outcome of the game went, but I didn't really feel like I had enough skin in the game. Like I wanted to feel like that adrenaline that you get as a player of being involved in, in the action. So his advice to me is that if I wanted to be a bench coach at any high level of hockey, that I would have to go to, to juniors and, and, and work my way up from there. And fortunately he was big, great friends with Danny Flynn, who was Brad Flynn's father, who was the head coach in Corpus Christi. And Eric made a call for me, and Brad hired me, and and now I'm here. Um, I have a question on the Brahma situation, because obviously you kind of just became the head coach very quickly there, like kind of yeah. like very unceremoniously, and then you yeah. won a Fraser Cup. Yeah. And I like – that experience, obviously, you know, you go to that EP page of yours, there's a trophy on there with number one on it, you know, that, you, that that's never going to taken away. Kind of walk us through how that all came about. And then obviously you parlay that into success that you've had at Lone Star now in Amarillo. Yeah. So Dan, Dan called me when, when the incident happened and, and asked if I'd be interested and got me in touch with Frank. And I ended up driving from Virginia Beach, Virginia to, you know, to, to North Richland Hills, Texas. And I got there on the last day that the, the regular season. Uh, so we basically had a week to get ready for playoffs. And I cut the video from the last game. We, we made some changes and we had such a great group of guys. Like Michael Redman was the captain there and he had been involved in the league for three or four years. And, uh, went, ended up going to Augsburg and, and just really good young players that that team that won the championship was basically all 18 years old, eight to 18 years old. So you had Tyler Blanchard was there. Jack Cooper was there. Uh, Andrew Trellstad, Matei Paul, Fee, Ian Erdman, like a lot of these guys that 
weren't recruited by me. I can't take the credit for recruiting them. Um, but they were just really good hockey players. And they had such good veteran leadership in that locker room that no matter what happened that year, uh, they just stayed focused on the task at hand. I think even before the incident that led to me being there, the assistant coach was in a car accident that almost took his life and his wife's life. And they just they kept on humming. So uh, they were a really resilient group and it was fun going through playoffs. We didn't lose one game in playoffs. It was kind of a Cinderella story for the, the Texas Brahmas winning that championship. I think we caught everybody a little bit by surprise from the South uh, coming out of there. And then we went into the next year and had a great regular season where we finished first in the league and, and COVID ended up canceling playoffs. Felt like we had a really good chance of going back to back. We were on like a 21 game win streak uh, when that season was, was canceled. And we had a great goaltending duel with du duo with Bryce Runyon and Caden Hargraves, who ended up playing at mm -hmm. Fairbanks and is now going uh, to Augustana division one. So we had a great team that year. And then the next year, we had another good team, which was basically the same team that we started with two years before. We didn't add any of the null drops or anything that was going on through COVID. And, you know, we had a great showing through playoffs and just unfortunately couldn't get the job done at the Fraser Cup. So it was a lot of fun being with that 3HL team. A lot of those guys are really, I owe sitting in this seat, I owe them a lot for believing in me and believing in what we were trying to do and, and allowing us to have the success that we did that can, that helped elevate me to the next spot in my career. I, I think, cause I was there for that Frazier cup and I believe 2019, I'm, I get all my years mixed up, but that was the beginning of boring. I'm just saying like you <laughs> suffocated every team though. No, I, I mean, that as more as a compliment in this case, but like, in this uh, case. I remember, I, like in this case, like you played, like you played Binghamton, you shut down St. Louis. I mean, the LA Nordiques or, yeah, the Nordiques at the time were you know high flying four or five goals a game, and you shut them down to one in the championship game. Like it was, like it took the like you said, it took the league by storm. Kind of like no one really expected that at all. I mean, I know we sitting around, you know, I, I watch a lot of games. I watch probably over a thousand games a year. I feel like between the NA and the NA three, and I can tell you for a fact that no one at our table was picking the Brahmas that year. And out of <laughs> nowhere, and like you said, not only did you win, you you dominated from start to finish. Like there was like we got through that second day of pool play, and we're like. Holy crap, this team's actually pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Like they, they were just, they bought in right away. Like they, they knew they weren't going to win doing what they were doing through the regular season. So as a group, they just decided, hey, this is what we're going to do and we're going to buy into it and we're going to execute it to the best we could. I mean, we literally only had about 10 practices through playoffs to get ready for that, which was unbelievable how how quick they picked up how we wanted to do things. And then if you look at the goaltending we got that year, though, in the, in that Fraser Cup, between Thomas Held and Bryce Runyon, like, we had a really hard decision going into that championship game on who was playing because they were both lights out and we were going to break somebody's heart. Um, and we ended up going with Bryce Runyon, and he stood on his head. Some of the saves he made in that championship game were unbelievable, but – they didn't have many chances either, which is always nice. No, <laughs> that's that's a lone that's a lone star Brahma Texas Brahma mo. You're gonna get like ten shots a game. You better make them count. Yeah. Speaking so, of Brandon, two partner here. Uh, part number one, probably the weekend series that you've had circled on your calendar since you took this job now as head coach up there in Amarillo. It is the RA slash Wild Pong Bowl. <laughs> Starting this weekend on the sixth, uh, you got obviously you guys will be heading down uh, to some familiar area down here in Dallas Fort Worth against the Lone Star Brahmas. Uh, first off, let's have you talk about just how excited you are for this matchup. I'm surprised you guys are even in the building right now. Second part of that, was it or is it anti purple week in the in the rink everywhere? No, nobody can wear purple. You know, I think um, it's a bigger deal for guys like you and Vinny than it is for guys like Dan and I. Like. <laughs> Obviously, it's, you know, a matchup people, I think, are excited to see. And obviously, that you know, I owe a lot uh, to Dan and what, what he did for me as a coach and as a person. But uh, we're still great friends. And I'm sure we're going to talk before the game and after the game. But during the game, we're both competitors and we're going to compete. Mm -hmm. um, it is exciting to go back. I have a lot of friends there. Uh, my sister lives there. Uh, my little niece, who's about to turn three, lives there, and I'm going to get to see her. So I'm more excited about seeing familiar faces. Uh, the week doesn't have any more or less uh, stress or, or excitement or any of that than a normal week. Uh, all these games are worth two points, and we want to get them two at a time, right? So 
Um, it's just making sure we're prepared ourselves. Like they've played a few more games than us. They have a little bit more competitive reps under the lights with, you know, it on the line. And I think uh, we're going into game seven. So our expectations have to be, you know, proper and we have to make sure we're taking care of ourselves. If I go crazy this week and, hey, they're going to do this and they do this and they do that and they do this. Uh, and I just get our guys all wound up and confused mm-hmm. about what's going on and we're not worried about ourselves. We don't have a great chance at having success. Obviously, you know, Dan knows that I know. And it's a little bit like that friends episode where it's like, do they know that I know that I know? And then, it, you know, <laughs> so there will be a little chess going on, but I got to make sure that I, as a coach, that I'm, I'm more worried about our guys and making sure they're prepared to execute what we want to execute. And if we do that, I think we have a really good chance. Obviously, we know what to expect going into the, going into the Nine Tech Sports Center. It's going to be uh, a hostile environment. The fans are going to be loud. Uh, the Lone Star Brahmas are going to play a certain brand of hockey where you don't get a lot of time to make plays, and you're going to have to be ready to make a play with a guy on you. And and we've been preparing for all these things. There's nothing nothing new that they haven't heard, and we have a lot of great veterans on our team that have been through it before. So we got to rely on those guys. But. I'm excited to go back. I'm excited to to compete against a mentor of mine and see how I stack up. But I'm more concerned about how our team plays and how our team is prepared and, and how our team is going to execute. Definitely. So there's no thought into uh, like how you know Nick Saban disciples don't do well against Nick Saban. Nothing like that. I mean, I'm all in, I'm zero and zero right now. You can't say there's a stat yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> all right, Ryan. Well, this was de- definitely far from boring. That's for sure. We learned that uh, risotto is uh, going to be on the menu when we come visit in Amarillo. Hopefully in the winter time, at least where I'm at, it's going to be cold. Brandon, maybe not so much. Um, and gosh, we we learned a lot here, I think, today. And we we learned that you might be our favorite guest that we have because I mean, we just have this good report. It's not boring at all. And I hope the fans great. out there believe so as well. So thanks well, for coming out with us. Here's to having a 0-0 game on Friday that Dan and I can both go home happy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll be we'll be rocking and rolling in our boring little world. All right, all right, all right. Been a pleasure. Good luck the rest of the way, and we will uh, we'll talk to you soon, my friend. Well, we want to thank Ra again for stopping in on the podcast. You found out there he's not boring, right, Vinny? No, not at all. He knows how to cook. I didn't know he was in the Navy either. That was cool. Yeah, I, that was uh, we, we kind of brushed over that. Today. But, yeah, we did, but you know what? That probably made him into the man and the coach that he is today. True. Very true. Along and with, and the chef. And the chef. Oh, maybe. That makes sense, actually. Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Well, anyways, really cool to have him on. Really cool to learn more about him. Uh, obviously, the the RA Wild Fong Super Bowl this weekend here in uh, Dallas Fort Worth. So that'll be that'll be fun to fun to watch and get some reaction, maybe or possibly from those two guys. But um, yeah, I think that does it here for episode fifteen, season two, episode two. Anything else you want to throw in there, Vinny? Just uh, watch the games on NHL TV. A lot of great action coming up, and uh, can't wait to uh, see what happens. Because, like we kind of mentioned earlier, it's any, I mean, season's still young. Teams that are struggling right now can get hot. Teams that are hot right now can struggle, start to fade away a little bit. Alaska Mm -hmm. trip starting up the late games. Oh, man, I can't wait to stay up to about one, two in the morning (laughs) and watch these games. I forgot about that. (sighs) Excited. We're back. Can't wait. Hockey's back, back. baby. Fully back. back. Fully back. Awesome. All right. Well, that does it here for us. We will catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Short shifts. Brandon Hofstra, Vinny over there. One of these days I'll get it. Vinny over there. Thanks for watching.